24. Communion and Culture Heretical doctrines of communion assume that the believer, on partaking of the bread and wine, is mystically made one with God the Son, that is, that the recipient becomes one with the divinity. Late medieval mystics made much of this quote-unquote fact, and it has remained as an aspect of the Roman Catholic and Protestant doctrines. While not so boldly stated as in the mystics' versions, all the same it is held that there is somehow a union of some sort with God the Son. Scripture teaches something somewhat different. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. We are here told, first, that our communion is the communion of the blood of Christ. We stand together as a new creation through the atoning blood of the Redeemer. Our communion and community are a product of his nullification of the fall and his regeneration of his elect people. We are thus a new humanity in him. There is no implication here of any mystical union with the deity of Christ. The meaning is that the incarnate one has redeemed us by his atoning blood. Second, the cup we partake of, the communion wine, is therefore the cup of blessing, because we thereby commemorate and celebrate our new creation by his grace in our atonement. We take the cup as the cup of blessing, rejoicing that in Christ we are a blessed people, and we bless that cup in joyful gratitude and praise. We should not therefore fall into idolatry, St. Paul warns us, as we interpret baptism and communion. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak to the wise men, judge ye what I say. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. The prevailing views of communion involve idolatry, and idolatry is in essence the worship of the creature and ultimately self-worship. Third, the bread of communion commemorates the broken or crucified body of Christ, again reminding us of his atonement, but it is not that alone. It is the communion of the body of Christ, his redeemed people. Not the dead body, three days in the grave, but the living body of his elect people is in mind. Our minds are turned to the present. By becoming partakers of that atonement, the shed blood and the crucified or broken body of Jesus Christ, we, being many, are one bread and one body. We are the new humanity of the new Adam, Jesus Christ. Fourth, idolatrous communion is fellowship with devils. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20. The Greek word here is koinonos, communion, fellowship, sharing in common. Our common life and the things we share and have fellowship in are with the Lord's people, not with the ungodly. The same word is translated in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18 and 20 as partakers. To share in common the Lord's table means to share in common a faith and a new life in Christ. Very early, however, another interpretation came in under pagan influences. The sacrament was seen as an aspect of the deification of the believer. The roots of transubstantiation are in this belief. Very many church fathers declared that God became man, that men might become gods. Gregory of Nyssa declared that 
In no other way was it possible for our body to become immortal but by participating in incorruption through its fellowship with that immortal body. Gregory declared further. The question was, how can that one body of Christ vivify the whole of mankind, all that is, in whomsoever there is faith, and yet, though divided amongst all, be itself not diminished? Rightly then do we believe that now also the bread, which is consecrated by the word of God, is changed into the body of God the word. Since then, that God's containing flesh partook for its substance and support of this particular nourishment also, and since the God who was manifested infused himself into perishable humanity for this purpose, that is to say, that by this communion with deity, mankind might at the same time be deified. For this end, it is that, by dispensation of his grace, he disseminates himself in every believer through that flesh, whose substance comes from bread and wine, blending himself with the bodies of believers, to secure that, by this union with the immortal, man too may be a sharer in incorruption. Especially in the Eastern Church, where Greek and Far Eastern ideas were influential, such ideas flourished. Chrysostom, in his Epistle to Caesarius, shows similar tendencies. In his commentary in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29, Chrysostom showed the evidences of a non-biblical interpretation of the body of Christ, writing, But why doth he eat judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, that is, not searching, not bearing in mind as he ought, the greatness of the thing set before him, not estimating the weight of the gift? For if thou shouldest come to know accurately who it is that lies before thee, and who he is that gives himself, and to whom, thou wilt need no other argument, but this is enough for thee to use all vigilance, unless thou shouldest be altogether fallen. Because of this development, we can understand why the bishops, having alien ideas about communion, worked to suppress the agape feasts or communions of the early church and forbade the clergy to attend them. We have too long accepted their propaganda concerning them. The communion service of the early church was very early seen in part as a continuation of the feast of rejoicing before the Lord with one's tithe in terms of Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 22 to 29. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 29 requires the feeding of the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless and the widow, and very early both the church and the Christian community held agape feasts to invite the widows and the poor. The Council of Gangra, circa 325 to 381, in Canon 11, condemned critics of the love feasts, declaring, If anyone shall despise those who out of faith make love feasts and invite the brethren in honour of the Lord and is not willing to accept these invitations because he despises what is done, let him be anathema. An African code of 419, however, sharply separated communion from the love feasts and it required in Canon 41, that only men who fasted be allowed to celebrate the sacrifices. The Senate of Laodicea, in circa 343 to 381, Canon 28, forbade love feasts in the Lord's houses or churches. Quinisext, in 692, ordered excommunication for those who persisted in holding love feasts in churches it is clear that it was not disorders, but rather hostility to the practice in principle which led to the abolition of the love feasts. A few groups have revived the love feasts in modern times, notably the Mennonites, the Dunkards, and the German Baptists of the Anglo-American type. While the service of communion and the love feasts are not identical, one having its roots in the Passover 
the other in the tithe feast. They do coincide in practice in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in New Testament practice. It is clear that this was a coincidence of necessity and expediency, not a requirement of faith. However, in intent and meaning, the two are very closely related. Neoplatonism and Aristotelianism both favoured the development of transubstantiationism, and in Aquinas we see the consequences clearly. In Aquinas' sermon before Pope Urban IV, circa 1264, he declared, O marvellous sacrament, in which God lies concealed, and our Jesus, like another Moses, cloaks his face under the creatures he has made. May all generations praise him. Wonderful is this sacrament in which, in virtue of the words of institution, charged with the divine power, the symbolic species are changed into flesh and blood, in which accidents subsist without a subject, and in which, without violation of nature's law, by consecration, the single and whole Christ self-identically exists in different places as a voice is heard and exists in many places, continuing unchanged, remaining inviolable when partaken, not suffering any diminution. Nay, he is whole and entire and perfect in each and every fragment of the host as visual appearances are multiplied in a hundred mirrors. In another context, Aquinas held, The only begotten Son of God, being pleased to make us partakers of the divine nature, took our nature upon him, being himself made man, that he might make men gods. For Luther, too, the accidents of bread and wine conceal the actual flesh and blood of Christ as their substance. The reason for this Luther held was that he, Christ, did not want to give us his divinity unconcealed. This was impossible, for God said, Exodus chapter 33 verse 20, Man shall not see me and live. Therefore it was necessary for God to hide, cover and conceal himself, thus enabling us to touch and apprehend him. He must disguise himself in flesh and blood, in the word, in the external ministry, in baptism, in the sacrament and Lord's Supper, where he gives us his body in the bread and his blood in the wine to eat and to drink. He must conceal himself in forms to which he adds his word in order that we may recognize him. In his small catechism, Luther taught, What is the sacrament of the altar? It is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine for us Christians to eat and to drink instituted by Christ himself. Van Til has called attention to the error in Lutheran theology which makes such views of the sacrament possible. It is a disregard for Chalcedon's formula. With all the refinements of the terminology employed, as, for example, that Christ is present, not in the natural mode, but in a supernatural mode, it remains a fact that according to the Lutheran position, the human can become the divine. And that is the crux of the matter. That is a distinctly dangerous doctrine. That is anti-theistic in origin and tendency. It not only involves, but is, an open avowal of the intermingling of the eternal and the temporal. It is once more in line with the Greek idea of the independent existence of the temporal. In consonance with this eternizing of the temporal, Schenkenboga speaks of a temporizing of the eternal on the part of Lutheranism. He brings this out in his discussion of the perseverance of the saints. Lutheranism does not believe in the perseverance of the saints, he says. It holds to certainty for the moment, but believes that it is quite possible for a man to be actually saved at one time and actually lost at some later date. 
This position of Lutheranism, he then traces back to its conception of the relation of time and eternity in general. Here, Schneckenberger, who himself favours the Lutheran position, asserts that according to Lutheranism, the eternal can be temporized and the temporal can be eternized. The infinite enters into the heart of the believer. He is happy and rejoices, but when the infinite withdraws, the salvation has also disappeared and joy is no more. Thus, we find that instead of eradicating the leaven of paganism, Lutheranism once more returns with longing eyes to the flesh pots of Egypt. If there was need of anything, there was need of an emphasis upon the absolute distinction between the eternal and the temporal if the difficulties of platonic reasoning were to be avoided. And exactly there we are disappointed in Lutheranism. Very early in church history, these tendencies were apparent. In Monophysite thought, the human is absorbed into the divine. In Nestorian thought, the human, by an act of will, can unite itself with the divine and become divine. In either case, there is a confusion of the human, the created, and the divine, the uncreated. The definition of Chalcedon. AD 451, denied the validity of all such thought. Only in the incarnation of Jesus Christ is there a union of the divine and of the human, of God and of man, but even here. In two natures, without confusion, without change, without division, without separation. Monophysitism cannot create a Christian culture. It involves an abandonment of history and its ultimate consequences in favour of an internalising of the temporal. The temporal thus loses meaning unless it transcends itself. Time becomes important only as it seeks to become eternal. In Nestorianism, the reverse is true. Eternity is temporalised. Eternity gains meaning only if it is a dimension or a potentiality of time. Nestorianism thus creates a humanistic culture which it divinizes. The communion services in modernist churches can be characterized as implicit Nestorianism, whereas evangelical and orthodox churches observe an essentially monophysite communion Although transubstantiation has been dropped by them, its framework is retained. The communion service has substantially the same meaning, except that the elements are not mystically changed in their substance. One might say that they still partake of the real body of Christ in the sense of his flesh, except that it is mystically rather than substantially understood. This is unhappily true of the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 29, section 5, which reads, The outward elements in this sacrament, duly set apart to the uses ordained by Christ, have such relation to him crucified as that, truly, yet sacramentally only, they are sometimes called by the name of the things they represent, to wit, the body and blood of Christ, albeit in substance and nature, they still remain truly and only bread and wine, as they were before. As authority, the Confession cites Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 and 27, and the parallel passages in Mark and Luke. There is, however, a difference between the Gospel accounts and St. Paul's statements of the meaning of communion. First of all, the Gospel accounts are before the event set forth in the communion, the atonement, and St. Paul writes after the event. The one speaks of a sacrifice about to take place, the other of one that has taken place and is observed in remembrance. Luke chapter 22 verse 19 of the event as Christ required. 
There is a difference, and a vast one, between an atoning death and a remembrance of that death. Thus, when our Lord, before the event, spoke of his body and blood as set forth in the elements of bread and wine, they symbolized what was soon to be the reality of the new covenant in his vicarious sacrifice. If we retain the original meaning, we are logically celebrating the perpetual sacrifice of the Mass, and Rome's position is logical, if such be the case. Second, while there is a backward look in St. Paul's account, and this too in remembrance of me is stated twice, for both the wine and bread, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 and 25, there is a forward look also in Till He Come, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. And the present and future are both in mind with respect to the people or body of Christ. This is also apparent in the original, the Last Supper itself, in at least the reference to the new drinking. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Matthew chapter 26, verse 29. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Luke chapter 22, verse 18. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Mark chapter 14, verse 25. The commentaries do not give us a satisfactory interpretation of this statement. Clearly, however, it is intended to give an insight into the meaning of the wine of communion. Here, our Lord does not speak of it as blood, as in Matthew. It is this fruit of the vine, meaning the wine used in the Last Supper. Because the commentators discuss the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, without reference to John, they fail to make any connection with our Lord's own commentary after the Supper, John chapter 13, verse 2, on what he had done. Having declared the significance of the wine, and having spoken of the fruit of the vine, can it be an unconnected symbolism that he should then speak of the vine? Should we not look to that statement for the meaning of the Lord's table? Jesus declared, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruits, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, nor can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As a father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, 
for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. John chapter 15, verses 1 to 17. The disciples could recognize the symbolism immediately. In the Old Testament, Israel was the noble vine of the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 21. Hosea, however, declared, Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. Hosea chapter 10 verse 1. Now, it was clear that Jesus Christ is the true Israel. Out of Egypt have I called my son, Matthew chapter 2 verse 15, and also the true vine. Jesus called his disciples also the new wine, which required new wineskins, a new culture to be free to expand and realize its being, Matthew chapter 9 verses 14 to 17. The disciples thus saw the old Passover succeeded at the Last Supper, by the new Passover and the old vine replaced by the true vine. The body and blood of the physical Jesus would, within hours, bring atonement for his elect people, freed from the false consequences from the power of sin and death. They would now be the new wine, breaking the old world's wineskins and bearing to every area of the world the joy of the new wine. They were also the branches of the true vine, required to bear fruit. If they failed to do so, they would be cast out and burned as false or untrue branches. A central aspect of that fruit bearing is to love one another. This is emphatically restated. Thus, the Passover, celebrating redemption, is linked closely with the tithe of rejoicing with the Levites, the poor, the lonely and the needy. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 22 to 29, as an aspect of the true observance of the Lord's table. By their love and by their expansive force as the perpetually new wine, they are to create a godly society, to establish the kingdom of God. Third, St. Paul makes clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16, that the cup is not the blood of Christ, but the communion of the blood of Christ, and the bread not his flesh, but the communion of the body of Christ. Both thus celebrate a fellowship or communion, because the many of us are one bread, one body, since we all participate in the one bread. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 17, Berkeley Version. And Phillips renders 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 17 to 18 thus. Because there is one loaf, we, many as we are, are one body, for it is one loaf of which we all partake. Look at the Jewish people. Are not those who partake in the sacrificial meat sharers in the altar? Each faith, St. Paul says, has its own fellowship in terms of its own doctrine of salvation, and our fellowship is in Christ's atonement. If we are truly redeemed by Christ, then our fellowship, in terms of discerning the Lord's body, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29, by love and mutual help and charity, is ever active and alive. Such a teaching is not the occultism of the mystery religions of antiquity, It is the purpose of the living God, as set forth in the creation mandate, in the law, and through his only begotten Son, required of those who are made the people of God by his grace through the atonement. Communion, in this sense, is in the faith of all the scriptures, and in conformity to the biblical doctrine of the Incarnation, 
as defended by the definition of chalcedon. The communion elements are not another incarnation. They are not a mystical absorption into or union with the divinity of Christ. Communion celebrates our redemption and sets forth the requirements of Christian community. It summons the branches to bear fruit in obedience to the word of God and, as the new wine born by the true vine, to break all the old wineskins of a fallen world 